experience that most affected me was the um, checkpoint going into Jerusalem. You understand that these things exist before you come to Palestine, but I don't think until you've experienced it, you don't really quite understand the apparatus and the kind of mechanism in place. One gets the impression that actually these, you know, th there's nothing accidental about the way that these checkpoints work, work on you, work on your spirit. You know, that these are well thought out. They are intended to humiliate, they're intended to dehumanize. For example, we went through one checkpoint and one of our numbers set off the alarm as he came through because he was wearing a belt. He had to take off his belt, he went through again, he set it off, he had to take off his shoes. Fair enough, you're looking for bombs, you have to do that. But then it followed three more of our number, went through the same checkpoint and set off the alarm and they weren't asked to take anything off and that was because the soldier who was behind the checkpoint and who was supposed to be asking you to was actually tweeting on her phone or, or doing emails on her phone at the time. That indicates to me that they don't think there's a security situation going on. They're not really looking for arms or for guns. What they are doing is putting people in their place and trying to stop the free movement of a whole people. And that is something that I knew in theory, but I really experienced firsthand, and I think is incredibly shocking about what's going on here. I think in terms of when you're asking about intentionality, I think you see that far more in Jerusalem, where, I mean, there's a plethora of laws and bylaws and contradictory kind of pick and mix approach to, to, to the law. There are all these intriguing little details that add a kind of juridicalized cruelty to it, which, which really does take your breath away. So in East Jerusalem, we met up with some activists from an organization called Grassroots, and they took us around the neighborhood where they're based, which is being essentially eroded bit by bit from within by settlers taking over houses. Sheikh Jarrah is the neighbourhood that uh, embodies physically the, the policy of uh, the occupation of displacement of Palestinians and Judaization of the city. Since here the, the case is that there are so many families, and I'll tell you a little bit about their history, uh, so many families that are under the threat of eviction from their homes where in, into these homes Jewish Israeli settlers move in. By far the most poignant, the most um, affecting thing was that we were invited in by uh, a woman who, uh, whose house is threatened by some of the kind of um, extraordinary Byzantine legal tangles that the Israeli state uses to, to repossess houses familiar you are with this, but after the Nakba and after many Palestinian owners moved out of Palestine, uh, there was a body created by the Israeli authorities called the Guardian of Absentee Property, which before was called the Guardian of Enemy of Property. And so this Guardian is actually guarding the Palestinian property until the owners come back. Of course, they won't let the owners come back, so you can do the math. But, uh, but and, and that's how the Israelis claim, or the Israeli authorities claim, that this belongs to them. But it's very important to note that there are double standards and that the, the right of return is not granted for the Palestinian refugees. The house had an orchard, which is the land outside. And so they occupied that and they uh, they tore up all the trees. It was all like this. She says it was all green and that got all torn up. So if you don't get out of the house, I'm going to tell you one person. I said, why? We're living in the house. There's a law, there's a court. I said, I'm the law and I'm the court. Okay, so this all was a month ago that they took the land there and tore up the trees. And he told them that they had two months uh, from, that, from then to clear uh, the house. Um, and. Uh, she uh, told him, you can't do that, we're not living in a, in, a, in a jungle, there is a law here, and he said, I'm the law here, you have got two months, and otherwise I'm just going to kill you one by one. She had a second floor built up ages ago for her boys as they grew up, and of course the municipality has already torn that down. And made her pay 5,000 shekels for the cost of tearing it down. It's not enough 
to fear that this house you've lived in, you know, your life is is about to be taken away. You have the kind of added glaze of of what feels very much like spite. I got really exhausted because of what they were doing to my children and what they were doing to my son. I said, okay, maybe it's better to live in the street than have this happen to your children. And it's tough. There's terms like present absentees, you know, contradictory laws and words that kind of don't really make sense in, the, in a normal world. You have families who are literally living by each other who have different um, documentation, those with the blue ID, those with Jordanian passports, as well as the blue ID, those with Israeli passports. So, you know, it's a, a clear intention to kind of fragment and dislocate Palestinians within who are, you know, actually displaced within their own home. So, you know, there's that added factor that's, um, you know, not, can't be anything but Kafkaesque. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ray Dolph and I work for UN Ocha, which is the humanitarian arm of the UN. In terms of cutting off um, Jerusalem from the remainder of the West Bank, what happened in 1967 is Israel had a census and only Palestinians who are registered in Jerusalem in 1967 or their de descendants can actually live in Jerusalem. What happens, for example, if a Palestinian from East Jerusalem wants to marry somebody from the West, West Bank, from Bethlehem or Ramallah, for example, they have a problem because the, West, the Bethlehem or Ramallah spouse is not allowed to live in East Jerusalem unless they apply for something called permanent uh, family unification, which has been suspended since 2003 for security reasons. The alternative, of course, is for the Jerusalem spouse to go and live in Bethlehem or Ramallah because they can do that. But that also causes problems because if the Israeli authorities find out that a Jerusalem resident is living outside Jerusalem, this is just for Palestinians, they can revoke their residency. These are all factors pushing Palestinians out, out of Jerusalem. To kind of simplify, you have the, you know, the clear violations of settlers coming in and uprooting families and taking over their homes and dividing areas up, but you also have a kind of systematized way of um, slowly eradicating any Arab Palestinian presence in East Jerusalem. Yes, certainly the Israeli state loves it when internationally it is able to show film of soldiers removing settlers. But compare that to the vast array of military hardware um, and strategy designed to clamp down on Palestine. Um, there is no comparison. The idea of the state being any kind of neutral broker between these groups is, um, you would call it a joke, but it's so far beyond funny. It's, it's, it's just, I, I think it would be nice to treat that notion with the contempt it deserves.